Thank you. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. We're uh, really excited about the evening we have planned. Uh, uh, many of you uh, got a chance to meet uh, our special guest and our host uh, tonight uh, just before we started. Uh, congratulations to you. You are some of the first people in the world to ever be in this theater. This theater opened uh, four nights ago, so uh, uh, we're excited to have this. This is the biggest theater in the, uh, the biggest screen in the city, um, and uh, uh, you'll see in just a few moments uh, uh, why this uh, screen is pretty special. As Pat mentioned, it's uh, always an opportunity for us to, um, to promote uh, our museum. We love uh, the Rochester Hills Van Heusen Museum and what it affords us to do. It affords us an opportunity to tell stories about our past uh, to many of the folks that will be here well into the future. And we're doing that in a, a little bit of a unique way today. As uh, uh, Pat mentioned, through the Broomfield Center for Leadership, uh, we're going to introduce you to one of our community leaders tonight, uh, a gentleman who is uh, the Entrepreneur of the Year uh, in 2015 or 2014. He's a great friend of mine. Most people know him uh, as the CEO of Imagine Theater and more intimately as the guy who reminds you to silence your cell phones um, each and every time you come to an Imagine Theater. I'll tell you another side of Paul Glantz and that he is a, a cult hero. Um, uh, he and I were on the tour this past month where we were in charge of judging the high school homecoming dance competitions. And uh, I came in and they announced me and I got what you would at best call a round of applause. Uh, and then they announced Paul Glantz and the place went crazy. Um, they lined up about 12 deep around him for selfies, and uh, I think even he was surprised at, uh, uh, at the way he's been embraced by the youth of the community, probably because uh, most of their first dates occurred uh, here at the Imagine Theater. Um, I'm grateful for him because he's always very generous with his time and his talents and his treasures. This is a reinvestment in the city of Rochester Hills, and uh, anytime we ask Paul or his team to help us out with something, they always say yes. Um, he's also, perhaps uh, uh, not uh, lesser known, as the CEO of Proctor Financial. That's really where uh, he cut his chops in the Metro Detroit business community, grew that uh, firm, uh, starting as an accountant from about a million dollars to a, a $50 million firm, and now has grown Imagine Theater from one theater to 17 theaters here in a multi-state region. So he's a fantastic person, he's a wonderful friend, and tonight we get to introduce him as a community leader. Um, he's gonna talk for a few minutes, then we'll have a couple minutes for Q&A, and then we'll get to watch tonight's film. So Ladies and gentlemen, a warm round of applause for Mr. Paul Glantz. Paul? Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, for that uh, gracious introduction. Uh, and for those of you who reside in the Rochester Hills area, you may know that uh, Mayor Barnett holds the record for the longest running policy trailer in this venue. He is really the this, this star, and uh, you know, there was so much demand, I think we're gonna need you back for a new policy trailer this spring. Are you available? All right, we're in. Well, it, um, it is genuinely a privilege for me to address you tonight. I wanna thank you for the opportunity to appear before you. I wanna welcome you to our, the new addition to our, uh, our business here. We've been uh, warmly embraced by the Rochester Hills community. And um, that embrace has allowed us to continue to expand this business. And so you're sitting in uh, what we call our Emax Auditorium, which is a premium large format screen. Uh, and I got the dimensions now. It's uh, 60 feet wide by 28 feet tall. But I'll tell you candidly, it's gotta be more than 28 feet tall. I, I, I don't know how we got that dimension. Um, we're very fortunate. We're fortunate to have you as our guests. I'm very fortunate to have a loving family. And so what I thought I would do tonight, with your indulgence, is just to tell you a couple stories. And I'm gonna suggest to you that leadership starts at home. And it started at home when I was a kid, maybe, say, six or seven years old. And my mom was working afternoons. My dad worked during the day. And so I would stay with some neighbors across the street before, until my dad got home. And George and Virginia treated me like a prince. I was a source of revenue in their household because my mom 
paid for them to watch me after school. Now, it's a tale of two families because my mom's family came from Serbia, Montenegro, and my grandfather emigrated to Galveston, Texas, just in time for the hurricane of 1900. And they lost everything but their lives in that hurricane. The folks across the street, George and Virginia, George's father came from the old country as well, and he ended up working in the copper mines in the Upper Peninsula. Now, it's hard for us to conceive today what life was like 120, 130 years ago. But candidly, from what I think we can all discern from history, it was a lot about survival. And in fact, George's family, and George's father in particular, really only knew survival. Working in the mine, making enough to earn a subsistence living. And my grandfather, by contrast, had a, well, I shouldn't say by contrast, he had a very similar experience in that after leaving Galveston, he moved to the coal mines of the West Virginia Ohio border. My mom was born in Steubenville, Ohio. My grandfather worked for, in a coal mine where you lived in the company housing and you bought your food at the, at the company grocery store. <clears throat> Turned out that my grandfather and grandmother had nine children. And we lost my grandmother around 1930 for pneumonia. This is, of course, before the advent of antibiotics. But there was one substantial distinction between these two immigrant families. And I don't know how to explain it. I don't know where it came from. But my grandfather, Mitar, who was a single father of nine children, knew how to show his children love. And the most important thing to Mitar in life were his children. And it was fascinating because the do-gooders of the time thought it was inappropriate for a, for a single man to be raising nine children. And there, was, there were folks who wanted to take the children away from my grandfather, thinking he was incapable of raising a family of nine. Well, George's family was a little different. All George's father knew was survival. So there was an element missing in his life. He did not know how to show love. And so George grew up in an environment where he wasn't loved. He wasn't told that he was loved. In fact, when George turned 16 years old, his father said to him, come on, we're going to the mine. And allegedly, George worked one day in the mine and then lied about his age and came down to Detroit to work in the Dodge Main factory building cars for the rest of his career. But not having learned to love, George didn't know how to show love to his children. George would tell his children, and he had four of them, that they were good for nothing, that they were useless, and they would never amount to anything. Now, the sad truth is, you know, and I, I'm talk, what I'm really talking about here is that we're all shaped and our leadership skills are honed at a very young age. I'm not sure George was leading his family in an effective manner. I was the source of resentment in their family because they liked me. I was the source of revenue and they treated me like a little prince. But we reap what we sow, and George sadly sowed seeds that resulted in each one of his four children spending time in a Michigan penitentiary. 
By contrast, in my mom's family, virtually every one of the children succeeded in life. Their, their, their children have gone on to succeed as I have. And why? They were loved. They were told every day of their life that they were loved. And contrast that with George and Virginia's family, where they were told they were good for nothing, that they were useless, they would never amount to anything. And by golly, George created a self-fulfilling prophecy, didn't he? So I would respectfully submit to you, we start by leading in our home lives. And if there's one takeaway tonight that I hope you'll harbor with you, it's when you go home tonight, I hope you'll tell those in your household, those that you love, that in fact you love them, just as I love my wife Mary, and my son Jim, who are, here, who are both here tonight, and I love our son Jack, who's back home. I love you guys dearly. So that's my first story. Second one I thought I'd share with you is one I think is particularly poignant for young people. It's a lesson I learned sort of after the fact. And that is that whether we recognize it or not, we are auditioning every day. And we're not auditioning for things that we even know about. We could be auditioning for future consideration. And so my story goes like this. I had the privilege of graduating from Wayne State University with a bachelor's degree in accounting. That's where I met my lovely wife, Mary. Both of us uh, earned a bachelor's degree in accounting. And I had the good fortune eventually to get a job in public accounting. So while I was working in public accounting for a big firm then known as Ernst & Winnie, today Ernst & Young, I met a lot of lovely people. One was in particular a gentleman I consider my mentor and my friend to this day. His name is Jim Hahn. Now, I'm working for Jim in the early 80s. And by the way, Brooks, uh, Bob Dada was part of that team, too. Another good, good man from those days. I'm working for Jim, and little do I know, but I'm apparently demonstrating something that he thinks is of value. I'm just trying to do the best I can to work to the best of my ability. And apparently, Jim was sufficiently impressed that when I'm looking to raise what I would characterize as angel capital to build our first new build theater in the mid-1990s, I had a lawyer who originally was going to be our angel investor. He backed out at the last minute. And I'm scrambling. We've got land under contract paid for architectural and engineering drawings. We've got a loan lined up with a bank, and we're ready to go build this theater. I've just got one problem. I don't have the equity to build this theater. That's when I discovered that apparently I had auditioned pretty well with Jim, because Jim saw in me a person that he could trust a person he thought was trustworthy, someone that he thought was hardworking and diligent. And lo and behold, Jim and his friend Dale Hull were our original angel investors. They invested $450,000 in what's today Imagine in 1996. And without their $450,000, I can tell you I would not be here tonight. And so I'm sharing with you two stories that you might think are somewhat unrelated, but it all gets back to why am I here tonight? Well, I'm here because my parents loved me. I was their only child, and even though they fought at times, kind of a tumultuous marriage, candidly, the one commonality was they both loved their little Polly. And then it turned out Similarly, I'm here because 
I had apparently done well by Jim. I had acted in a trustworthy fashion, and he entrusted his hard-earned capital to me and my then partner. And so we don't know what life holds. But what we do know is how we can conduct ourselves, how we can behave in society, how we can treat others. And I'd like to believe that by putting the interests of others ahead of your own, that they will take note and they will eventually reward you for your behavior. In fact, I often tell my teammates that it's their responsibility to provide value in excess of their cost. Now, I've had some people say to me, well, that's not fair. I should be paid what I'm worth. And in fact, that's true. But if you do not provide value in excess of your cost, a business cannot succeed. Because all businesses, in order for capital to be rewarded, must provide a return. I hope I've earned my way. I know that I have the privilege of having a number of investors today. And as you might know, or you can discern by looking around you, it's not inexpensive to do these type of projects. I'm delighted to have the support of folks who have entrusted their hard-earned capital to me over time. And I am infinitely grateful to those people because without their capital, I would genuinely have nothing but my loving family. And so I'm um, an extraordinarily fortunate man. Brian pointed out that while I was the entrepreneur of the year, I also have a day job. And I'm fortunate that my corporate parent puts up with that dalliance. And I consider this my hobby. So I hope you enjoy my hobby as much as I do. So with that, I'd like to just simply uh, suggest that if you have any questions, I would be delighted to entertain them. Brian, did you uh, want to make any comments? No? OK. Well, then uh, again, if, if, if you have any questions for me, uh, please stand up, shout it out, and I'd be happy to try to uh, address your interests. Um, I was sharing earlier with some folks that I think that as consumers, we're all empowered these days. We're empowered with our, with our wallets. We're empowered to vote for Imagine or to vote for one of Imagine's competitors. And so, of course, I'd like to earn your votes. But I think that as industries mature, there's an opportunity to evolve them into narrower niches. And so we're going down a path at Imagine where we're targeting audiences that would value a particular experience. So for example, perhaps you'll value the premium large format auditorium that we're sitting in right now. Or perhaps you'll like what we're doing in Birmingham at Royal Oak which is we've developed what we call a screening room concept. And the screening room has somewhere between 12 and 24 chairs, all power recliners. If you'd like to rent that for a group outing, we'll hand you an iPad. And with that iPad, you can control the sound, the lighting, and you can also pa pause the picture. So can you imagine? You're watching a first run film, and you need to take a break in the film, push your iPad. And so that's another element. <clears throat> we call it our screening room concept. And so the broader question is, we don't know what the future holds, but we're going to try to make sure that we're meeting the needs of consumers. And so in addition to the two I've just mentioned to you, we have a concept called Dine and View, where we're bringing food and beverage to your chair while you're watching the film. Now, some people may say, well, that's distracting, and you and I wouldn't argue if you think that way. That's why we're going to continue to offer a, 
um, traditional movie going experience, which is what we have here largely. So we've actually trademarked the term movies your way. And so our theory is we want to learn from you, our guests, what you would value. And it's our job to craft that experience around your needs, your specific expectations. And in doing so, we hope to offer you a compelling value proposition and ultimately a wonderful out-of-home experience. Yes, Phil. We're, uh, we're still learning from uh, what we're doing in Royal Oak. However, we're using that as a basis to gather data to determine whether or not there's sufficient demand to expand it. And so the next place we would expand it would be in Royal Oak. And thereafter, if it continues to show great promise, then we hope to expand the dining view menu to other venues as well. And so we'll be adding some additional cooking equipment here quite soon, which will allow us essentially to have the means to provide a dining view experience. And then it'll all be about uh, whether or not folks vote for that, uh, for that particular experience. Because if you vote in favor, we'll have it. If you vote no, then we'll offer you a, a, uh, a uh, traditional movie going experience. Brian, I'm turn it over to you. Thank you, Bob. So, out of curiosity, um, what happens uh, if someone's phone goes off when you're actually in the theater? What do you actually do to someone who doesn't silence their phone when you're in the theater? I, I used to take ushering on on personally, and I found it wasn't a good idea. <laughs> and so now I have to call an usher <laughs> because I, uh, I had some folks being really disappointed with my behavior. <laughs> we have some Oakland County Sheriff's folks who will just taser you. If your phone goes off, expect to be tasered. We'll just try it. We'll see like you do. We'll, we'll see how it works. We'll pilot it here in Rochester Hills, and we'll see. Maybe we'll try it in Royal Oak. Hey, listen, uh, one more round of applause for uh, Paul Glantz and uh, his kindness in hosting us. So we're going to show uh, um, a great uh, picture here, a great film, uh, The Justice League. It's uh, 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 had a, a, a great entrance into the market over the past weekend. I want to know one thing, two things. First of all, thank you for being here. Thank you so much for, for supporting uh, this program, for supporting our museum, and for supporting our city. Uh, we're so blessed to live in a great community. There are, um, you might think there's only one Paul Glantz. There really is, but there are lots of great people that make our community great. And we're grateful for the business owners, the residents, the PTA folks. Um, so many people work to make Rochester Hills the preeminent place to live, work, and raise your family, and this is one of them. So we, we thank you for being here and supporting our efforts. As you leave the theater today, you each of you has a gift. Uh, so we want to make sure that you get that, a, a thank you for supporting this event tonight. And finally, one quick story, because it's kind of interesting, and you may have seen it on the preview here if you came in early enough. Uh, in this uh, movie, uh, of course, we've got Batman, Superman, uh, and The Flash. The Flash uh, is Ezra Miller. Ezra Miller filmed a movie in Rochester Hills in 2011 called um, Sam, where's Sam? Where's happy, day. happy Day. Another Happy Day, thank you. I should know because I was in the credits. Uh, I didn't do much in the film, but I got to make the credits. My wife was in the movie as well. Um, Ezra Miller came to the city of Rochester Hills. There's some Rochester Hills employees in the crowd today. Uh, you might remember we had an event. We hosted him and Alan Barkin. They came into the city, and we had a wonderful experience giving him a Rochester Hills Oscar. We made this whole thing up. They came in, they bought it, and we gave them these awards. We never had created them before. We just made them up the night before, and they came in to receive them. It worked out, right? Good branding. Yeah, I was just so, say, can I ask you? so, so when's Madonna gonna make her picture? Oh, oh yeah, that's a that's a word we don't talk about here. Uh, you notice we're not showing Evita tonight. Um, so anyway, so when you see uh, The Flash, you see Ezra Miller, know that he's only in this movie because he received a Rochester Hills Oscar uh, several years ago. So ladies and gentlemen, enjoy the show. Thank you so much for being here, and we hope to see you out at the Rochester Hills Van Houston Museum real soon. Thanks, everybody.